So <clears throat> welcome everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Allison Moore, uh, one of the co-leads of the Ontario Animal Health Network Equine Network, along with uh, Dr. Jessica Peatling. And thank you for attending our webinar tonight. Um, this is part of our 2022 webinar series. And as probably you've heard in previous webinars, these topics were brought to you by the survey that you filled out. Um, asking you know for more information about certain topics or topics of interest so hopefully you'll find these very useful to you um, we have two more webinars coming up one october 27th on vitamin e and selenium with dr shannon pratt phillips and december 1st on equine asthma with dr laurent Coute. so mark those in your calendar a um, couple of housekeeping um, uh, topics right now is you're all on, on mute. So if you have a question, please type it into the chat. It will be either at the bottom or the top of your screen, a bubble that says chat, and I will try and answer them uh, as we go along or certainly at the end of the talk. Um, we're gonna go to probably a hard stop at 8.30 just because we don't wanna go on too long. We know time is, is precious, precious to you all. So we're gonna get underway. Um, this is our third webinar series, um, PPID in the Horse, with Dr. Kristen Thane. Dr. Thane is a research associate at Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine. She is board certified in large animal internal medicine by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. She is currently researching new therapies to treat horses with insulin dysregulation and has recently completed work evaluating methods for diagnosing endocrine disorders in horses. So welcome, Dr. Thane. Thank you very much. Um, I'm excited to talk to you all tonight. Thank you all for coming. Um, and yes, uh, you know, do feel free to answer or ask, feel free to answer questions too, but feel free to ask any questions. Um, if it's something that seems like it's a really urgent question, um, maybe just say urgent right um, at the time. Otherwise I tend to try to collect them at the end because I find a lot of people often will have similar questions or things that relate together. Um, but if I flub something because it's late at night and say something that's totally wackadoo, um, feel free to pop in right at the time and say, did you actually mean that? Because um, I'd rather clarify if there's a point of confusion as we go along. So tonight I'll be talking about uh, PBID or pituitary pars intermediate dysfunction function in the horse. Um, we'll dip our toe a little bit into EMS and insulin dysregulation um, because of uh, how sort of interconnected those are, but I will be trying to focus on PPID um, based on uh, your all interest in, in the topic. Um, I did briefly want to just do a land acknowledgement um, and note that uh, Tufts Coming School is situated on the traditional lands of the Nipmuc people, and I want to honor the lives and histories of the Indigenous peoples connected to the land. Um, for my disclosure, um, much of my prior research has been supported by Barner Ingelheim Animal Health, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, and their products. So for tonight, we're going to review some terms and definitions, briefly take a tour through the passive physiology and the clinical signs of PPID, um, and then um, start to do an overview of the diagnostic tests that are available um, to diagnose and monitor PPID and finish up with pharmaceutical and management strategies for horses um, with PPID. So endocrine disease is a huge topic, um, and there are entire conferences devoted to that. So we're really only scratching the surface tonight. I mean, it's a complicated topic, so I'm not necessarily going to be able to cover everything to the nth degree um, as much as I'd like to. Um, but this is a big plug to say, if you have questions that are a little nitty gritty um, or about a specific case, um, reach out to your favorite local uh, internist, um, because we're always happy to, to nerd out and talk about that sort of thing. Um, I also want to mention that this is about horses, um, because uh, particularly if there's any mixed animal practitioners here. Uh, this disease is quite different in dogs than it is in horses and so um, and in people. So uh, what you would do in horses in terms of treatment, testing, etc. is going to be um, quite different um, potentially than what you would do in a dog. And also, um, I don't know why anyone would do this to a dog, but I find it funny um, to see. Um, it's also uh, not focusing on other equids. Um, so donkeys and mules are in uh, an area that is uh, really needing additional research. We'll touch on it a tiny bit at the end, but um, much of what I'm saying is going to be talking about just horses tonight. 
So um, much like your, uh, the call for topics of interest, uh, PPID research is interest to veterinarians across the world. And there's actually a recent paper looking at areas um, that are research priorities uh, for specifically PPID. And whether this is, is good or bad, um, they identified 10 areas that really need additional work because they lack any or multiple or robust um, information about the, the following topics. And so <laughs> I'm not going to belabor these points, but you'll see the topics are very common and very important things relating to these diseases. And so, um, for example, progression of PPID in a horse's lifetime, um, what medical treatments um, or, or non-medical or non-prescription treatments might be efficacious in, in addressing PPID, um, things like uh, can we reduce the risk of laminitis in these horses? Even a more robust analysis of the side effects of pergolide treatment. Um, what to do when pergolide is not efficacious or stops working. So um, these are topics that people want to know about, but unfortunately, there's not necessarily um, a huge amount of published literature about most of these things. But with the advent of this paper, I am hoping that there'll be renewed and, uh, and ongoing interest in these topics, and so that um, additional analyses um, in these really critically important topics can can go on. Um, there's a great resource available, um, which hopefully you're familiar with, but if you're not, here's the website for it. Um, it's the Equine Endocrine Group. They meet every year, and every other year they release a new um, recommendation guideline for treatment of either PPID um, or EMS, and treatment, diagnosis, et cetera. And so every two years, these are updated um, by the experts in the field and, you know, relating to the most current and up-to-date knowledge. And so that's how we have our, you know, newest recommendations for seasonally adjusted um, interpretation of ACTH, for example. So the most recent PPID um, group statement came out in 2021. This year they'll have a new one on EMS, but every year it switches back and forth. So uh, I think since you've all elected to be here, you probably know what PPID is, but just as a quick reminder, it's pituitary pars intermediate dysfunction. So it's the pars intermediate of the pituitary that's affected in horses. Um, um, many people still refer to it as equine Cushing's disease. Um, this is different from Cushing's disease in dogs and horses where it affects the pars distalis. Sometimes you have a CT of your horse um, and you can see that there's a giant adenoma in the pituitary, but usually we're not quite so lucky in identifying that um, based on imaging. Um, it's probably not terribly lucky for the horse, but it, it makes the diagnosis potentially easier. So the pathophysiology of PPID, just to quickly review, is that with this disease, you get progressive degenerative um, breakdown of uh, the hypothalamic dopaminergic neurons. And what that means is so the neurons um, in the hypothalamus that produce dopamine stop producing as much dopamine as they break down. And um, that dopamine normally in, uh, provides inhibitory control of melanotropes in the pars intermediary of the pituitary gland. So if the pars intermedia um, is no longer um, being inhibited by the dopamine, uh, there begins to be hyperplasia of the melanotropes, which can then lead to micro or macro adenoma formation, depending on the length of the disease and the severity. Um, and those uh, PI melanotropes do produce POMC or pro melanocortin. Um, for everyone to have a quick flashback to biochemistry, um, POMC is the precursor that is cleaved into uh, the things that we care about, ACTH, alpha MSH, CLIP, a um, variety of others. Um, and where, you know, the amount of cleavage that occurs in the final product depends on uh, pro-hormone convertase one or two, and those are variably present um, depending on which, uh, basically, which part of the tissue you are in. So for PPID, the only known risk factor as of right now is age, um, with increasing age, increasing the risk of this condition. So uh, right now, reportedly, there's a 20% prevalence of PPID in horses aged 15 years or older, and that incidence increases to 30% in horses that are 30 years or older. So increasing age, increasing risk of this disease. Um, there's no, as of yet, breed or sex predilection or known genetic um, sort of predilection for it, unlike some of the other endocrine diseases that, you know, like uh, insulin dysregulation that, uh, that we're concerned about. 
Now, the pathognomonic sign of PPID, what everyone thinks about is hypertrichosis, um, formerly known as hirsutism. Um, they changed the terminology because actually hypertrichosis is a little bit more accurate um, in terms of just um, generalized excessive uh, hair growth um, um, or lack of shedding in these horses. When the disease condition is severe, um, it can manifest like this with just a generalized long hair coat, lack of shedding. In earlier stages of disease, this may not be quite so apparent. So you don't have to wait till for, you know, full-blown severe disease um, to begin seeing some abnormalities in, in the shedding patterns or in the um, uh, incidence of just longer hair in specific areas on the horse. Those areas that tend to be most affected with sort of those uh, low, you know, longer hairs um, that just persist a bit longer um, than, than is normal would be under the mandible, along the jugular groove, backs of the legs, um, those kinds of areas. Um, but you can see there's a huge constellation of abnormal signs that accompany PPID. And unfortunately, there's a lot of overlap between mild and severe disease and also with a number of other diseases. So none of these is going to be, uh, you know, the one sure thing that tells you that you definitely have PPID, particularly in an early case. Um, but uh, it's really important to routinely be doing very thorough physical examinations and getting in good thorough history to be able to identify some of these changes that may have historically or be currently occurring um, to try to put together a picture of do you think that the horse that you're looking at right now um, potentially might have uh, PPID and it's worth testing to do um, some, some confirmation there. Uh, this chart was actually from the older version of the uh, working group recommendations. Um, now they've actually started to triage um, sort of what you see in order just to make it a little bit more um, easy to sort of understand uh, what sort of order you're likely to see the signs, but this isn't totally prescriptive. Um, so horses may have one, multiple of these signs, um, and, uh, you know, and, and it will vary based on their disease state and any other, uh, you know, comorbidities that they might have um, affecting their overall health. Again, I want to really highlight the importance of the overlap of equine metabolic syndrome and insulin dysregulation uh, with PPID. So horses that um, have a history of laminitis, um, sort of traditional dogma says test them for PPID, particularly if they're older and shaggier, great. But you also really want to consider um, strongly uh, assessing their insulin status because um, as we'll talk about in a minute, hyperinsulinemia has, is known now to be far more correlated with um, development of laminitis than perhaps was previously thought. So there's a lot of new, new information about that and the role of insulin um, as it relates to development of laminitis in horses. Um, and you can see here from this Venn diagram, you know, this is really just trying to highlight the areas of increased risk of development of um, clinical laminitis. And so what we're trying to do, of course, is to uh, identify these horses based on these sort of more um, subtle but less clinically devastating clinical signs before they develop laminitis. If we can identify and begin treatment um, or prevention strategies, um, you know, if they have concurrent uh, EMS and ID, um, then we have a better chance of, uh, of basically preventing them or reducing the risk of developing laminitis, which is obviously a clinical goal. Again, laminitis, you all know what this looks like. So like I mentioned, um, you know, there's been a major shift in the thinking over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years about the pathophysiology of laminitis, um, with the majority of laminitis now known to be associated um, with an endocrinopathic laminitis, um, with much lower percentage being sepsis associated or mechanical. Of course, those still occur, and particularly in your very sick horses, as with, you know, systemic um, illness and inflammation like pleural pneumonia or enterocolitis, um, those obviously are at risk for, uh, for laminitis as well. But um, endocrine dysfunction is a primary driver of, of laminitis in horses. Um, and the, the mechanism is still not fully elucidated, um, but it's thought to be related to stretching and elongation of the lamina in response to insulin and thus the, the destruction of the normal architecture there and development of the clinical signs that we're so familiar with. So the prevalence of laminitis in horses with PPID varies considerably depending on the study population that you look at. Um, it's as low as 8% reported in some studies and as high as 80% in others. So um, obviously it's gonna always be in the back of, of our minds as something associated with PPID, but I think um, our, our thinking um, has shifted somewhat um, to say, okay, a horse with, uh, with laminitis it may have PPID, but also test it for uh, insulin dysregulation too, to be able to address that as that's more likely the driver there. 
All right, so practical question. When do I test a horse for PPID? Now, I understand um, that uh, TRH is not available in Canada. I will be talking about a TRH stimulation test because it does show up a lot in the literature. We do have it in the US, and it's a test that we use a lot um, for greater sensitivity. So I'm sorry it's not available there yet, um, but uh, hopefully it will be at some point um, just to increase your uh, your sort of clinical testing regimen that is available to you to potentially identify some of the, uh, the horses that are um, at earlier stages of, of disease. Um, but much like the earlier flow charts, this tends to try to break down into very practical categories um, so that you can best triage the way to approach testing, but the test might tell you um, how best to spend an owner's money, um, you know, and doing testing that is going to give you an answer or something that you can follow through with. And so um, I, I won't go through every part of this chart, but really it breaks it down into um, horses that are much more likely to have disease, um, older, advanced clinical signs, those that are less likely, um, and the type of testing that you might need to pursue um, to to get a lab confirmation of your diagnosis. Um, and I also want to highlight here that, you know, some people may be really against testing and just want to treat. That's potentially fine. You know, if you have a horse that all of your clinical suspicions are that the horse has PPID, they're older, they have uh, the generalized hypertrichosis and or other clinical signs consistent with PPID, um, there, it's not wrong to begin treatment. The only caveat is that if you are going to subsequently do any laboratory testing to assess response to treatment, it's much harder to do if you don't have a starting value to be able to compare back to. So our baseline test is just baseline basal ACTH. Um, that can be taken at any time of the day. Um, it does have a lower sensitivity, higher specificity, um, but that doesn't mean it's a bad test. It just, you know, it, it know what it know what it's likely to be telling you. Um, it's convenient in that it's a single measurement. You do need to take it um, in an EDTA tube. Um, it does require EDTA plasma. ACTH is also a little bit more delicate as an analyte than some of the other things that we test for. I'll get into that a little bit more later, um, but you do want to be a little bit more careful in your sample handling there than you might for a standard CBC in chemistry, um, just because you want to make sure that you get the most reliable results out at the end, um, you know, just through careful handling of your sample um, from the time of collection. So as I'm sure you're all familiar with now, there are seasonal results um, for, uh, you know, for this even basal testing. And so what that means is uh, the time of year that you test will have an effect on what the normal ACTH concentration is. Um, and uh, if you are familiar with the older guidelines that came out, you'll notice that these numbers are actually a little bit lower in terms of the cutoff for unlikely. And that's actually because of a change in the analyzer for the um, um, for ACTH, which uh, was a prior machine. It's a more updated version of the machine. So um, that, that kind of leads into you just make sure that you know what type of testing, um, both in terms of the analysis that's done and the reference ranges that each lab is going to be using. Um, and overall for consistency, sticking with one lab is your best bet. We'll get into that a little bit more later. But if you're looking at this and saying, huh, I think these numbers look a little different than what I'm used to, that's just because these are the newest values that are updated for the, the machine that's currently in use these days. And this is related to um, information that came out of Andy Durham's lab, um, first presented in 2020 at the Global Equine Endocrine Summit, um, which basically modeled what was happening in ACTH concentrations in normal horses um, versus abnormal horses, um, and then led into the development of what's in the working group document as areas that are, uh, you know, where a result will fall into definitely supportive of diagnosis, unlikely for diagnosis, or then an equivocal zone which is a lot harder to, you know, to, to potentially try to think your way through just from a number perspective. And that's where having your clinical appreciation of what the horse looks like, um, the physical examination and the history really helps you to try to figure out what to do next in terms of do you repeat testing? Do you institute therapy? Um, you know, how long do you wait? That kind of thing. Um, and that's going to be very individually horse dependent. Um, and uh, But at least with these new seasonal guidelines, you can tell during different times of the year what a normal horse should be expected to do and whether your horse is definitely in the abnormal or normal range, that helps you. And hopefully most horses are, although of course those, you know, 5% of horses or whatever that are not following, you know, the rules are the ones that create all the headaches. So I understand that frustration for sure. 
Okay, so again, US, uh, you know, related here, but um, TRH stimulation test is done here frequently. It's a little bit of a more sensitive test um, to identify horses that have an abnormal response to TRH stimulation. So all horses should have an increase in ACTH, um, but the, re the resulting ACTH following stimulation in horses with PPID is much, much higher um, than in horses that are normal. And so we use that as the basis of, of our laboratory diagnosis. Um, the procedure is largely the same. You're collecting blood in the same manner into an EDTA tube. Um, it just requires administration of a dose of TRH. We get ours compounded um, through Wedgwood Pharmacy um, and use that reliably. Some research labs um, also uh, make their own from, from sterile-based um, product, um, but at least we have the ability to, to get it compounded here. Um, and then uh, blood is collected again at 10 minutes to measure the resulting ACTH in response to the TRH stimulation. Some lab groups um, research at 30 minutes. Um, the, the data about what the ACTH should be doing at that time is a little bit more limited. Um, so it's a little harder to interpret that, but you may see if you're looking through the literature, uh, a later time point for collection um, as well. So um, just if you're gonna go that route, make sure you actually have a reference range to be comparing against because that's not necessarily widely available. Okay, so then when we go to interpret that test, again, we have um, the same kind of uh, unlikely equivocal or positive ranges. You'll notice here there's a big caveat though. During the time of year when um, it, it, the basal ACTH is higher, uh, we don't currently have uh, a, a guideline for interpreting the TRH stimulation test. That doesn't mean that it's not um, you know, worthwhile to do at that time if you're trying to rule out disease, because at that time of the year, you're gonna have such an aberrant response that if you have a normal response, you're pretty sure that the horse doesn't have um, PPID at that time. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep monitoring them, et cetera, but if you really want to know um, and have the ability to do that test, um, that can help you out in, in, in that a negative test can tell you um, information uh, in, in a useful way. So there's also the dexamethasone suppression test um, available to test for PPID. Historically, this was thought to be a gold standard test because um, initial reports showed something like 100% sensitivity with it. Um, this is largely due to the fact that it was done in horses that were very, very profoundly um, affected by with PPID. And so um, a a, a very advanced case, um, or if your population is very advanced, your test is probably going to perform much better if you're only looking at horses that definitely have disease. Um, and so uh, when looking at a more normal, you know, population of horses that has uh, a range of disease severity, including early and sort of subclinical disease, um, the, the sensitivity and specificity of the test goes way down. Doesn't mean, again, it's not still a valuable test. It can tell you, you know, useful information if that's a testing uh, choice that you choose to pursue. Um, this is done on serum. Um, it does require administration of a dose of dexamethasone IM um, and then waiting overnight and collecting a cortisol the next day. So in horses that are normal at between 15 and 19 hours, it used to be you sample both times, they've tested and um, see that there's basically not, not a difference in normal horses. So anywhere in that 15 to 19 hour window, if you sample, um, cortisol should be still suppressed in, uh, in normal horses based on that initial dexamethasone dose. In horses with PID, um, the suppression of cortisol release is either reduced or absent. And so you'll get a higher uh, cortisol at the 15 to 19 hour mark. And so the interpretation is at the bottom there, um, greater than one microgram or 30 nanomoles um, per deciliter or liter respectively um, is consistent with a diagnosis of PPID. Um, I think fewer people do this test these days, but you may find that a lot in the literature as well. So um, again, it's, it's worthwhile to consider. Um, one caveat is that some owners may be reluctant to administer a dose of dexamethasone to a horse that is at risk for laminitis. And if there's a horse that is actively experiencing an episode of laminitis, probably everyone would be a bit um, wary about giving a dose of a steroid. So um, it may not be an applicable test at all times. Um, and then just to briefly uh, touch on, I'm not going to get into the details, but there's a lot of different testing for um, uh, equine metabolic syndrome or insulin dysregulation that's available. Uh, similar in nature that there's um, non-dynamic and dynamic testing. Uh, the non-dynamic testing is good for detecting um, basically resting uh, hyperinsulinemia if they always have a high insulin, um, an oral sugar test um, or an oral glucose test. There's a couple of different methods um, depending on where in the world you are. Um, it will induce um, a insulin response that is apparently high in hyperinsulinemic animals that have a postprandial um, increase in insulin. 
insulin montants, tests can detect some insulin resistance um, at tissue level in horses. So all of those can potentially be used. There's a few additional tests that are available, but they are usually kind of cumbersome and so typically are relegated to just um, research settings. But um, the, the, the three that are here are widely used and are really helpful in identifying the insulin status of your horse um, when, you know, when you've got a case that has laminitis or if you want to do more comprehensive endocrine testing while you're also testing for, um, for PPID. And um, if you do get the ability to test for, uh, you know, using TRH, um, you can combine dynamic tests to increase your um, efficiency while you are testing. Um, and so with that, um, you, you, again, you can combine the test, but the order of the testing does matter. And so you do need to do your TRH stimulation test first and your oral sugar test second, because that big dose of sugar um, can uh, affect your TRH results. Um, and so you make a spurious result um, if you do it in the other order. Now there's some other potential exogenous effects on the testing. So a question that comes up a lot is, can I test a horse that is actively experiencing laminitis or is stressed out for another reason or is really sick? Um, and that's gonna really depend a lot. Um, and some of those questions haven't been fully answered. So for example, a horse that's really sick in the hospital is probably gonna have some derangement in its base ETH. So is that a most appropriate time to test them? Probably not, but there isn't necessarily a study looking at that. There has been um, a study looking at pain, the one here um, in horses. And, um, and basically what they found here is that um, low level pain, so something that may be occurring in horses with controlled, uh, not worsening laminitis or not very acute laminitis, um, isn't likely to affect your ACTH um, concentration. And so uh, for a horse that is, you know, not normal in terms of laminitis, but is at least in a stable plane, um, it, it can be reasonable to test at that point. Um, there's some other things that have been looked at. So things like trailering and dentistry, um, which are thought to be, uh, you know, stressful situations. And so trailering was indeed found to be stressful enough to change ACTH levels in horses, but just transiently. So for, uh, you know, for the horses that they looked at, they only found um, a, a change in the ACTH level for about 30 minutes in most horses. So as long as you wait 30 minutes to an hour to, to do your testing, if a horse trailers in for, for testing at your clinic, um, then you should be fine. Um, and dentistry didn't seem to have an effect at all. Caveat being these are normal horses. Um, they haven't looked in PPID horses, so that may be different in horses that are, um, you know, that are not normal. But at least from a normal horse perspective, um, those activities have variable effects on, on your resulting testing. As I mentioned earlier, ACTH is a little bit more delicate than some other analytes. And so um, a lot of labs have looked at effects of a variety of different things on, um, on ACTH. And so uh, a couple of the main questions that come up are, can I let the sample just gravity separate if I'm out on the road for eight or 10 or 12 or 14 hours in a day? Um, answer to that is actually probably yes. Um, and so uh, delayed centrifugation didn't have a significant effect on ACTH concentrations, which is great. You should still centrifuge them. You should never send a and a sample on cells, and you definitely should not freeze a sample that's still on cells because that will cause hemolysis and, um, and assay interference. But if your sample is sitting, you know, in your truck, um, you know, until you get back to the clinic at the end of the day, that probably isn't going to have a huge effect on your ACTH concentration that you measure. However, room temperature will have an effect, particularly in horses that have PPID so that have abnormal ACTH levels. So it's important to keep the samples um, cooled, so four degrees uh, refrigerator temperature if possible, um, either in a cooler or in a refrigerator, um, even if you can't centrifuge right at the same time um, that it's collected, um, keeping it cool will certainly help to preserve, uh, preserve your ACTH in your sample and get a reliable result um, uh, once you send it in. Um, so this just shows um, in the one study the, the delayed time centrifugation and its minimal effects on, the, uh, uh, on the, the resulting ACTH concentration. And they actually waited quite a long time, 36 hours. So, um, you know, I wouldn't advise waiting that long, but uh, you probably have a window uh, for a work day to, to get your sample centrifuged. Um, this is actually a paper I did, um, which just was looking at uh, some deviations in the testing protocol itself. So um, what would be considered to be a pretty small time difference, only a minute in the timing of sample collection when doing a TRH stim test where you need to collect it 10 minutes, actually had a quite large effect on um, test results and interpretation. And so in this um, study, we found that 75% of samples collected either a minute early or late had a 10% or higher difference um, than the sample collected exactly at 10 minutes. And that 
effective test interpretation in about 20% of the horses. And so, um, you know, nothing went from all the way positive to negative or vice versa, but those horses that are on the, um, the, the sort of thresholds for uh, from equivocal to positive or equivocal to normal, those are the ones that were most affected by that um, change in sample uh, collection timing. Um, so if doing a TRH stim test, it is important to be as uh, time strict as possible. That hasn't been investigated for the later time point, so it may ameliorate it if you are collecting at 30 minutes, but again, hampered by the fact that it uh, doesn't have reference intervals necessarily available um, widely to interpret the test at the end. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, labs are not all equal. And so it's really difficult to compare any sort of results from multiple different labs because they may be using different equipment, different standards, et cetera. So if you are planning to do multiple tests on your patients, which I would encourage just to monitor um, progression to disease or a response to treatment, um, if you can use the same lab, that's gonna be your best bet for getting reliable results consistently. Um, and if you have to use a different lab, at least knowing sort of what the interpretation standards are for that lab and that machine will help you to try to, you know, to work between results if you have to do that. So sort of just wrapping that little section up, the diagnostic test to choose is never going to be totally cookie cutter, um, which is unfortunate in a way of, you know, it's it's not totally simple, but it really needs to be tailored to each individual patient um, based on the clinical signs of disease, where they are in the disease process. Um, the If you're looking to get an initial diagnosis, if you're trying to uh, um, assess response to treatment, um, and sort of as a thing that I keep in the back of my mind is, you know, as much as I like testing and knowing where we are, um, I want to make sure I only test when it's going to affect um, the therapy or management of the animal. And so if it's going to, you know, give you greater information to say, yep, my treatment's working or no, it's not, or the disease is progressing or it's stable, great. But, um, you know, this, this shouldn't be a blanket to every horse that I ever see should get tested. You know, you do want to make um, your testing decisions based on uh, a need to confirm a clinical suspicion um, or a assess a response to therapy. And also, of course, um, you know, horse owners are going to have some input there just in terms of budget, you know, their concerns there, logistics for doing some of the more dynamic testing, and then some concerns about the risks of the test with the dynamic testing that can occur. So, um, so all of that's going to play a role in what test you end up choosing for your horse. Um, we'll talk about retesting um, a little bit after we talk about the management side of things too. So, um, so let's talk about pergolide. So pergolide is a dopamine receptor agonist. It's the, um, you know, licensed treatment for, uh, for treatment of PPID in horses. Um, all other treatments, all other, you know, uh, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical treatments are off label. Um, and they recommend a dose of two to four micrograms per kilogram per day, um, which translates to a starting dose of a milligram for a 500 kilogram horse. Uh, if a horse is refractory to treatment, um, higher doses are considered um, in specific cases, but that is considered off-label dosing. Perla does have side effects, um, and so about a third of horses uh, report experiencing a transient period of anorexia. Um, when that happens, discontinuation of the drug for a period of time and then restarting um, or starting at a, you know, decreasing the dose and um, titrating back up or splitting dosing can help to, to manage that. Um, about 10% of horses uh, report uh, episodes of lethargy, uh, about 10% have a change in manure quality, i.e. diarrhea, um, and about 5% um, will have behavioral changes. Um, some owners report aggression or other behavioral abnormalities compared to before um, treating with with this medication. Um, does it work? Well, yes. Um, so uh, the, there's obviously an efficacy trial, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, for it to get licensed. Um, there was actually a pretty recent paper, this is from a couple of years ago, that actually looked at restoration of um, dopamine concentration in the pituitary tissue itself in horses that were treated with pergolide versus horses that were not. And so they looked at, the caveat being, of course, this is a very small sample size, as are most um, you know equine studies, but um, 
um, and they looked at young horses that were normal, um, old horses that were normal that did not have PPID, old horses that did have PPID that were not treated, and old horses that had PPID that were treated with pergolide. And so what they found is that pergolide treatment restored um, the, the dopamine concentration in the pituitary tissue to levels equivalent to that of, of basically age-matched horses that didn't have the disease, um, whereas horses that were not treated had almost no um, dopamine detectable in the tissue. So, um, you know, that it's shown to, at least in the study, have been, um, you know, having an effect at the target tissue where we're hoping it will. So that's great. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, there was an efficacy trial um, for FDA approval. Um, and so for that, uh, the, the company looked at 113 horses. Um, they established the diagnosis of PPID with hypertrichosis and abnormal endocrine test results, either the um, an abnormal ACTH value um, or uh, an abnormal um, overnight dexamethasone suppression test value. Um, they defined treatment success as improved testing results or and and or um, um, improved clinical signs. Uh, and uh, they had all horses start at the low end dose, the two mics per keg um, per day. Um, and they increased the dose, increased the dose only if needed um, at day 90 to the higher end of the dosing range. Um, in their study population, 42% of the horses did require a dose increase. Um, and they made that decision based on um, lack of laboratory improvement at the 90 day mark. So at day 180, they determined that 76% of the horses um, were considered a treatment success. And so looking at this information is actually available also if you're interested in it, um, both in the pergolide um, uh, summary information in the packet, um, and also there's a Freedom of Information Act um, document, which is about two or 300 pages long, um, which has lots and lots of information in it. Um, it's much more summarized in the package insert. Uh, but so they looked at a few sort of target um, uh, clinical signs and also um, endocrine test results. And I wanted to just point this out here um, as a way to kind of realign for thoughts of how quickly, um, you know, and how incompletely for some of the, you know, the abnormalities uh, resolution occurs. So for the um, for the hypertrichosis here referred to as hirsutism, um, um, most horses by that six-month mark did have improvement in signs, which is great. But at the at the 90 days, that wasn't necessarily seen yet. Um, and you can see all of the the differential, um, you know, for all of these other signs too. Similarly, ACTH um, definitely improved from baseline at both day 90 and day 180, but weren't normal necessarily. Um, you can see, uh, you know, this is from the 2020 insert, but the initial study was done in, in like 2011 or something. Um, I don't recall exactly the year, but um, it was done before seasonally adjusted values were available. So I can't 100% interpret this um, because I don't know what time of year these samples were taken. And so um, that's, a, that's a little bit of a caveat there um, uh, in terms of interpretation of those test results. Um, uh, the dexamethasone suppression test, you'll see also, um, if you recall, the, the abnormal is anything over one. Um, and so they improved, but they didn't normalize on this testing method either. So um, this is just sort of a, a good reminder that improvement um, often is clinical um, and, and may not be fully complete um, either clinically or, uh, or from a laboratory perspective. But a lot of the focus now is, um, is improvement in clinical signs overall as a proxy for treatment efficacy because the, um, you know, true normalization of the, um, you know, of the ACTH or other testing values may not occur, but may be, may not be necessary um, to say that you've got an effective treatment at the dose that your horse is currently um, receiving. Uh, there was a systematic review of a number of different studies looking at efficacy of pergolide. Um, they initially queried about 600 papers, whittled it down to a little bit over 100, um, and at the end, 28 merited inclusion in the systematic review. Even still, um, the methodology between the studies was too dissimilar to allow for a true meta-analysis of all of these, so um, they, they simply sort of reported and compared, um, but there are two main outcomes that they looking at is clinical improvement, which similar to the percent efficacy study um, was seen in uh, more than 75% of cases in, um, you know, in these publications that they reviewed. Um, but the lower ACTH concentration um, was anywhere from 44 to 74% of cases. So they saw greater clinical improvement than they did laboratory improvement um, of these values. Um, and this just shows it graphically um, for anyone who's more graphically minded. Um, 
So in these cases, um, you know, obviously pergolide is the approved therapy um, and many horses do very, very well on it. There are some other medications that people do consider for refractory cases. Um, and these are all off-label use of medications, um, at least in the US. I'm, I'm not fully familiar with um, prescribing regulations in Canada, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, uh, but so the, the sort of the drugs that are most commonly considered are um, addition of ciproheptadine, which is a serotonin receptor antagonist. Um, it's not great necessarily as a monotherapy in head-to-head -head comparisons of pergolide versus ciproheptadine. Ciproheptadine typically underperforms um, compared to improvements with, uh, with pergolide, but it's often added to therapy um, for horses that can't tolerate a dose increase in pergolide or just aren't responding sufficiently well to the dose of pergolide that you've been giving. Um, other therapeutics that are considered are bromocryptine and cabergoline. Um, those are both dopamine receptor or agonists, sorry, dopamine receptor agonists. Um, so they're similar and their mechanism of action to, um, to pergolide. Um, so you wouldn't use those concurrently, you use that instead. Um, the, unfortunately, the data on those are very, very limited. Um, and so it's uh, the, this paper here in the Veterinary Clinics of North America does have a little bit of information about doses that have been tried. Um, Bromocryptine is a once a day um, drug. Cabergoline is actually injectable and is every 10 days. Um, so there's some thought that that might increase compliance, but that would require owner training or more frequent visiting potentially. So um, Neither of those has been extensively pursued or researched yet, but um, stay tuned. Maybe they will be, um, you know, as just um, additional alternative therapies for, for this um, condition. So um, I said we'd get back to this. So when do we reevaluate and retest um, to see, you know, what, what the new status is? Well, current recommendations are one to three months after starting treatment, and then every six to 12 months thereafter. Um, and that's going to potentially vary a little bit depending on the time of year that you start testing the treatments that you are instituting, the severity of the disease. So once again, I'm circling back around to it needs to tailor to the individual patient um, and the, the goals that you're trying to achieve with that patient, and also whether or not you have any you know, concurrent um, insulin dysregulation that you've identified at the same time um, and uh, you know, what you might be doing on that front. So um, there's no 100% accurate answer for every single horse. Again, here, there's a sort of a flow chart set up for where you're starting and where you, know, where you are and sort of what the recommendations are to potentially continue. Um, but the, you'll notice here again um, that, uh, that they really highlight, um, this is the PPID working group document again, they really highlight the, the clinical science improvement um, and potentially improvement in insulin status if your horse is also insulin dysregulation as a really important indicator um, as a treatment response, uh, potentially more so than uh, normalization of ACTH itself. Um, and then uh, I just found this one really interesting. This is a paper looking at dosing compliance. Um, and uh, this raises some questions about, you know, does, does the actual very finicky titration of the dose that you're giving to your patients matter? Um, only because when they looked at dosing compliance, Compliance in this um, instance relates to a uh, human definition of compliance, which is that the horse receives 90% or more of the recommended dose of the of pergolide over the time period measured. And so um, this was a population of horses that were diagnosed and followed up for at least three months, but that amount could vary. Um, and so um, it's a retrospective study. There are some caveats to it. There's some, you know, some things that they maybe um, weren't necessarily able to capture, but um, their, their bottom line was that only half of the animals um, that they uh, were able to, to identify had received the recommended pergolide dose. Um, and that despite that, it didn't affect the laboratory control of PPID. Um, in the compliant group, 75% were controlled. And in the non-compliant group, 67% were controlled still. Um, and again, that, that's just uh, as a reminder, non-compliant doesn't mean they never received medication. It's just that they weren't receiving all the medication they were supposed to based on calculations the researchers did. Um, so it could be that an owner received, you know, some other horses extra pergolide, and they were in fact more compliant than perhaps was was recognized, or they were able to get a compounded product, or a variety of other things. Um, and they also didn't look at clinical improvement um, that a lot of the other, um, uh, you know, studies were looking at. So that I think that would be really interesting to see how medication compliance um, relates to uh, clinical improvement um, for these PPID horses. But as of yet, that is not known. Um, so hopefully, maybe this group will. We'll look into that as well. 
Um, again, just touching on EMS uh, or insulin dysregulation, um, it's really important to manage that um, well if uh, it is de detected at the same time that uh, that PPID is detected or was a pre-existing condition or develops later, any of the case. So, um, you know, horses that have PPID that, you know, some horses are also insulin dysregulated, some are not. There's not really evidence that PPID causes insulin dysregulation, but it very likely exacerbates insulin dysregulation um, in horses that are, you know, genetically or um, environmentally predisposed to developing it. And so um, actually, uh, you know, certain groups have found that treatment of horses with pergolide to address their PPID can help improve insulin concentration in insulin dysregulated horses. It may not normalize their insulin, but it can help improve it. And so fixing the PPID can um, improve the insulin status. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you might see some improvement there in conjunction with all of the other areas that should be managed in an insulin dysregulated horse. And so um, that's primarily and chiefly diet. Um, uh, you know, I think everybody, um, owners, that's everybody knows these days that high NSC feeds, so non-structural carbohydrate feeds, um, should be avoided in horses that have insulin dysregulation. Um, and so uh, that's, that's a little easier to, to, you know, to get compliance with these days. Um, pasture grazing should be restricted. That can be a little bit harder um, sometimes, depending on the situation of the horse and the owner um, to, to um, get good compliance with um, obesity management in horses that are the obese phenotype. Um, ex routine exercise definitely helps with, um, you know, with insulin um, sensitivity. Uh, that's going to be very dependent on whether or not a horse has laminitis. So obviously, you're not going to exercise an actively laminated horse, but for horses with good foot comfort, is something to pursue. Um, and then medication treatment as needed for refractory cases. Um, so the ones that don't normalize either after initiating appropriate um, PPID management and then subsequently, um, any other management, uh, dietary and otherwise, for, for EMS. Um, if for managing specifically hypertrichosis, um, there was a paper that came out this year that showed blue light therapy um, does actually have an effect on uh, the hair weight and hair coat, but doesn't have an effect on ACTH concentration. So um, that may help for horses that have that persistently long, shaggy, you know, non-shedding hair coat to manage that. Um, they basically uh, falsely extended photo period by shining um, blue light uh, into horses' eyes using sort of a mask setup um, and, uh, and did get decreased. Uh, hair weight in the horses that were treated compared to untreated controls um, in horses with PPID. Um, but it won't have an effect, at least based on this researcher's findings, on the actual ACTH measurement. So you still need to address that with, uh, with your pergolide. Um, uh, I think it's been sort of well known. Um, this is an older paper. It's, it's you know, 10 or 15 years old now, um, but looking at um, intestinal parasites. Um, so uh, horses with PPEID are likely to be more heavily parasitized than their normal compatriots. So uh, keeping a routine eye on their um, fecal egg counts and uh, appropriately deworming them is definitely warranted just to maintain optimal overall health. Um, there was a paper that came out last year nope, this year, um, looking at dental health um, as well um, and, uh, and basically saw some changes in PPID affected horses that may increase their risk for periodontal disease. Um, obviously, this is an older horse population to begin with. And so um, and having good dental health is key in order to maintain their ability to eat um, and not have, uh, you know, choke issues um, to try to prolong their normal eating as long as possible um, before having to swap over to to, you know, potentially a more complete feed. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in, in most species, we know that maintaining good oral health um, will help overall systemic health too, uh, particularly in horses that, you know, with PPID that may be um, more uh, immunosuppressed than their uh, than normal photo horses, um, just due to, um, I don't think I included it here, but um, there's been a, a couple of studies looking at neutrophils um, in horses with PPID that are less, you know, less effective, less functional than in normal horses, um, and also that alpha MSH, um, one of the increased uh, circulating um, sub uh, um, 
uh, products of the POMC um, is also uh, has immunosuppressive function too. So um, horses are at increased risk for developing systemic disease, um, sinusitis, dental issues, um, pneumonia, things like that. And so um, sort of good overall wellness control to minimize the risk of developing a more serious systemic infection is really critical for just maintaining good wellness in these horses. Um, there's a really nice paper that came out last year about nutritional considerations for management of um, PPID. Um, this also stresses the need to tailor individual plans um, based on patient concerns. Um, and so it looks at um, sort of the first separation of is the horse obese and needing to lose weight is, or is the horse under conditioned and needing to maintain or gain weight, um, particularly with concerns of uh, like muscle loss um, in horses. Uh, maintaining good, uh, you know, lean muscle in these animals will improve, you know, their, their overall health and quality of life as well. And so there's some strategies for, uh, you know, for dietary management and protein supplementation um, in, in those animals um, that can be targeted based on what your overall goals are for, for the nutrition picture for that particular horse. Um, and I did say I would quickly mention other equids. Um, so uh, unfortunately, the information available for uh, donkeys and mules is much more limited. We know that it's different. Um, you know that their their endocrine profiles are different than in horses. Um, and so there have been you know some smaller studies done over the years. Um, this one um, that uh, came out in 2020 um, aims to sort of gather some things together, and so it pulls together um, results from a number of studies to at least provide some reference ranges, both for baseline and for testing, um, you know, uh, for some of the dynamic testing too, uh, for, for um, mules and donkeys, which can help if you have these as your patients because, you know, we know they behave differently metabolically than horses, but the research in this front is, it, we still need a lot more, but this is at least a start um, to be looking at that. Um, and then as a, a quick um, little uh, locally specific thing, um, Dr. Moore sent me um, some data that was pulled from, um, from horses, um, I believe in the, all in the Ontario area um, over time, um, clinically normal senior horses, um, just to see whether or not they also um, demonstrated that seasonal change in ACTH. And indeed they do, um, just to sort of compare it to, I, I had to do a little Franken graph here to kind of compare it to what's in the working group document, but it follows a very similar pattern um, for, for what is seen in terms of uh, a seasonal rise. Um, you'll see here that the ACTH level is under 30 across the board, it looks like, and so, um, you know, maybe up into the equivocal zone, but not rising in, in your, you know, clinically normal horses to, to anything outside of, you know, um, into a yeah, PPID range here. Um, and so, uh, you know, very similar findings here. It looks like your, your peak is, uh, is mostly in August um, in, in Andy Durham's uh, info. It looks like it was maybe a little shifted a tiny bit later to September, but again, following a very, a very similar pattern there. So, um, so your local horses are doing the same kinds of things um, as, uh, uh, you know, as what the, the guidelines report. And so um, that's a little bit of additional evidence that, you know, you can use those seasonally adjusted guidelines. Um, with confidence when you're doing your testing in, uh, you know, in your horse populations. So um, I blazed through that pretty quickly because I wanted to make sure we had time for questions. Um, but just to wrap up, um, I just want to sort of focus on a couple of take homes, which is that PPID and ID are both commonly encountered. Um, they, you know, as we all know, they're associated with an increase of laminitis um, and other abnormalities that really decrease quality and quantity of life. And so early identification through clinical signs and history and then confirmatory testing is really essential in, um, you know, in being able to institute therapy um, or management as needed to, to try to, you know, prolong good quality of life in, in these horses. Um, your, your diagnosis is going to be based on, uh, you know, the most currently available information. Um, the, um, the Equine Endocrine Working Group tries to put out um, the up-to-date information as much as possible, so stay tuned to them for, you know, for, for as up-to-date info as, as is available in the published literature. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, remember that there's no one perfect strategy for every horse, um, and so uh, really tailoring the the, the diagnosis, the therapy, the follow-up to each individual patient is, you know, is your best bet in terms of getting your best clinical outcomes, um, you know, and best response to therapy. 
So with that, I got to show off a couple pictures of, of cute neonates that we've had in our hospital, and I will welcome any questions. I see that some have come through in the chat as things have been going along. So hopefully, um, hopefully I will be able to answer some or all of them. So let's see. Thanks so much, Christian. Do you want me to assist with the question asking here? Or? Well, I have pulled them up. And so, um, yeah, so I can see, I think I can see them all. I will run through them. If there's any that I seem like I missed, just, just pop in and um, and let me know. So advice on test race during concurrent laminitis episodes. So um, yeah, great question. Um, I think I touched on it a little bit briefly. Um, it depends on sort of the acuity um, and the severity of the pain um, or stress that's going on at the time. But at least that one paper that looked at sort of consistent, um, you know, low level, level to moderate level pain didn't seem to have an effect on the, the ACTH levels when they were looking um, in their in their experimental population. And so, um, you know, I think testing, at least with the baseline ACTH, is very reasonable as long as you've got a stable, even if still uncomfortable, level of laminitis in your patient. Um, at the very acute onset of, of disease, probably that's a little a little too soon to test that you might have falsely elevated results. Now they may be falsely elevated to way higher, whereas, you know, when you test, once they've stabilized, it's still higher, but not necessarily quite as astronomical. Um, that's entirely speculative. Um, you know, I think we all know that that high, both for um, ACTH and insulin testing can be very, very variable. Some horses, you know, have a high ACTH at, you know, at 70, and some have a high ACTH at 1200. And so, um, you know, it's uh, if if you can wait until at least until in a laminitis episode, you've got a stable plane. Um, you've got a much more robust um, potential testing window there than right at the beginning of an episode. Um, okay, and then and if I haven't fully answered any questions, feel free to pop it back into the chat, and I'll I'll scroll down and get to it eventually. I think I'm going through um, consecutively. So uh, next question is: We've uh, ordered and received TRH successfully from Wedgwood a few times now. The ordering process is finicky, and it can be a very long wait time. But we did get it. Oh, great. Okay. So um, it looks like Wedgwood um, TRH may be available. Um, and then with the seasonal rise period, positive predictive value being lower for a TRH scan. If you got a positive result during this period, in a case with clinical concerns, would you start treatment and then wean off percent in January and retest? How long do you stop for send before the repeat test? Okay, a couple of really good questions in there. So um, at the point that you are doing a TRH stim on a horse that you have clinical concerns, you, if you're already testing sort of off schedule, you probably have done a test where the basal ACTH was equivocal or normal. And so in that horse, it's probably going to depend a lot on the horse itself of what you decide to do, whether in tissue therapy or weight, um, or if you, and then when you decide to retest. So in a horse where, you know, you say, gosh, this horse is, you know, to every reasonable, you know, um, sort of perspective is uh, clinically looking like a PPID horse. They have a four foot long hair coat. They are, you know, sweating up a storm. They have lost their total top line. They're, you know, 25 years old. Um, you're probably just going to institute empiric therapy, um, you know, even with an equivocal uh, test result, uh, both basal or, um, or a TRH stim. Now, the only reason to really take off therapy if you were, if your clinical suspicion is that the horse truly does have, you know, uh, have PPID would be presumably to try to, you know, have a test done um, in a in as neutral a state as possible. And I don't think we have the information yet to really identify whether or not that's clinically warranted. So if your clinical suspicion is that the horse definitely has PPID and you start treating them and their clinical signs improve, that in and of itself is a good response to treatment. The frustrating thing is, particularly if an owner says, I really want to be able to follow to track uh, you know, an ACTH level, if the ACTH level is staying normal and they say, well, why, why am I you know, paying for this therapy you know, um, in a horse where the ACTH has always been normal, but the clinical signs have improved, then you, know, then, then you say, well, we've had all these resolution of clinical signs, you know, and and thus, you know, we can say just from the clinical improvement that the treatment is working. You may still want to monitor your your ACTH to make sure that over time, you know, with your your horse that it isn't starting to creep up, that you don't need to do a dose adjustment or change the medication. But I don't know that we have any research to say that you should take the horse off and then test them and then put them back on again. Um, 
So, and then the smaller part of the question is how long does it take for, for pergolide to basically be out of the system? Um, the metabolism is pretty quick. Um, and so um, actually, so horses will start showing a decrease in ACTH um, within a day of starting them. Um, and uh, they have done some tests to look at how long um, pergolide is detectable after the fact. And so um, they're able to still detect pergolide, I believe two days afterwards, but not at 10 days. Now the efficacy of it at two days is going to be variable. It's very horse dependent. Um, and this is all related to the, the you know, the clearance of the, the drug by the horse. Um, the half-life of the drug is variably reported um, at, you know, 12 to 24 hours. Um, and so it depends a little bit on what study you look at. But if you wait a week, um, you know, to, to a week and a half um, after cessation of treatment, you should be reasonably confident that the, uh, that the pergolide is out of the system and that the ACTH and then in, in that instance is no longer um, reflective of any residual pergolide in the system. Um, that was a lot of words. Hopefully that answered that question there. Um, okay, let's see. Can you elaborate on behavioral changes? I had a Rocky Mountain horse who became unable to be handled on one milligram dose, dropped to half a milligram per day and improved. What is your experience? Um, yeah, so I think it's sort of similar to you. It's idiosyncratic. Um, and so it's not necessarily, um, you know, a, a thing that we can predict and it may or may not be um, responsive to, uh, to a dose adjustment. So some horses, like in your case, you can drop the dose or you know, stop the dose and titrate them back up. Um, some horses simply cannot tolerate it. Um, it's it's really based on owner perception as well, um, you know, or you know, or veterinary perception, and so it can be a little hard to quantify what exactly is changing, um, you know, other than you know this horse was was fine and uh, you know on a pussy cat and now is a Siberian um, you know tiger and is going to try to rip my head off. And obviously, you, you know, if it's in association with a drug and then it goes away when you take them off, if you do a you know a drug cessation trial. You know, that's a, a pretty good indicator that that's, you know, that that's why that is happening. The actual mechanism behind it, a little unclear. Um, you know, uh, people used to receive pergolide um, uh, back in the day. They discontinued it for human use um, due to some concerns about um, changes in the heart, which have not yet been seen in the horse, um, but probably because people live a whole lot longer than, um, you know, than horses do. Um, and have vastly different physiology. Um, but so um, humans did occasionally report um, things like hallucinations potentially. Um, and so whether it's related to that at all or is it entirely just some other mechanism that we don't know, I don't know yet, um, it'd be very interesting. I think we'd probably know more about it if it were more commonly reported. Um, but it, you know, of the things that can happen, that's sort of a, a big deal. And so you know, not very many cases does still lead to you know, hearing about it when it does happen because it's, you, know, you need a horse that's handleable. Okay, um, I've heard of other, vet, other vets prescribing only a quarter or half milligram pergolide to a thousand pound horse daily. On the other hand, I've heard of vets prescribing up to six um, to get control of either clinical signs or ACTH levels comments. Yes, definitely um, that is uh, true and is potentially warranted. So, you know, dosing recommendations are meant to hit the majority of horses. Not every horse is going to require as much or as little, and it probably depends on the extent of disease, how much, um, you know, uh, of the dopaminergic uh, control you still have, depending on where in the disease process the horse is. So a horse that's very, you know, got very early, um, you know, uh, phase of the disease uh, may need less uh, pharmaceutical intervention to control, um, you know, the, the, the clinical signs, et Cetera, that are being observed. Um, and then the upper end, um, you know, some people walk the dose up, um, you know, beyond even what the, the CAHD tested range is. So they tested up to eight micrograms um, uh, per kg per day in, in the um, efficacy trial and the licensing component um, to get the FDA approval. Um, some people treat with up to 10 um, micrograms per kg per day um, in those really refractory cases. Um, it, and that will depend a little bit on you know how much you need to control the signs, um, how well the horse tolerates it, and you know whether or not you want to consider other types of medication. So um, you know so it's going to be horse to horse dependent. Um, but yeah, starting starting at a lower dose, you know isn't necessarily a problem either. You're probably going to, you know, not necessarily want to do that in a horse that you are concerned about, um, you know, having a greater severity of disease if you want to try to get that controlled a little bit sooner. Um, you know, if you feel like you're 
capturing the horse a little bit earlier in the disease course, um, playing around with the titration a little bit to try to achieve efficacy with the lowest possible dose is reasonable as well. Um, so, so yeah, a little bit of flexibility on the dosing, I think, um, is commonly performed. Um, the only uh, difficulty can be that splitting the pills into tinier and tinier bits um, starts to have some level of um, inaccuracy with the with the division, and also they recommend not crushing um, the pills, um, uh, and then. Of course, there's the big question of what about compounded, you know, because then you can have it at any other dose. Um, you know, some people certainly use that both for cost and, and other reasons of just um, trying to improve compliance. Um, it's, you know, obviously with a, with a FDA approved product, we can't recommend it. We know some people do um, just because that's the only way they're going to get it into their horse. Um, and so, um, you know, if, if possible, use the approved product, um, but we know that some people can't or don't um, for whatever reason. So um, there have been some, you know, some people have tried to look a little bit at the compounded product and typically find that it's less efficacious than the regulated product, um, but which is not terribly surprising. Um, but anyway, that's, um, yeah, that, that's a little bit off topic there too. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. You mentioned that reference ranges for diagnostic test results are specific to horses, but not other equids. Does that include ponies and miniature horses or are these ranges developed mainly for normal sized light breed horses? Um, so for at least as of right now, we are using these for ponies and miniature horses as well. Um, you know, we, we may um, further finesse or nuance the, you know, these ranges in, you know, in those groups of, of animals. Um, and I think the more we know, the more specific we can get in terms of development of reference ranges. The hard part is just finding horses that are affected, um, being able to monitor them for long periods of time um, and get lots of testing done on them to establish these ranges for normal, abnormal, responsive treatment not, um, which has sort of hampered our ability so far. Um, but for as of right now, we are using the existing reference ranges um, for, for all different sizes of horses, um, you know, from, from miniature to draft. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and have had success with that so far. All right, let's see. Sorry if I miss this. If you diagnose a horse with PPID with a TRH stim, the baseline was normal. Do you repeat the TRH stim um, when they're on pergolide for monitoring? Great question. So um, there's a practical answer and there's a recommendations answer. The recommendations answer is that, that they currently cannot make a recommendation to retest with a TRH stim um, while on treatment because we don't know what it's supposed to do yet. Um, the practical answer is a lot of people do, um, and the sort of uh, dogma is that, you know, it should be lower, but we don't know how much lower. And we don't know if it should normalize or simply look better. Um, and so that's also a kind of a question mark and a stay tuned. Um, I would love to know that piece of information because precisely for that um, sort of clinical reality. The horse has a normal basal ACTH level. You can only identify the horse as being abnormal with a TRH stim test. You do the test, great. You put them on percolite, great. Now what do I do? Because I want to test and get a laboratory confirmation of therapeutic efficacy. Right now we, you know, we mostly have to rely on clinical improvement so that the signs are improving. Um, if you do elect to retest, Again, it's not, you know, it's not codified anywhere, but sort of thinking is that the TRH stim, you know, result should improve, but by how much, we just don't have great guidelines on yet. Um, and, and hopefully that will be information to come as, you know, as horses that are diagnosed via testing are retested more um, just to get us greater information. Okay, I think that was everything that I see in terms of questions. Great questions. Um, is there anything else that you see? on your end that I missed? Oh, another one just got popped up there. Okay, uh, whoa, all right, so I gotta scroll back up to the, all right. Uh, another cherry stim question. I've been told anecdotally that if you take a baseline ACTH and it's normal and you want to follow up with a TRH stim, that if you follow up within a month, you can reasonably skip the baseline on the second visit, give TRH and take one sample at 10 minutes. Um, any thought on if that's reasonable? Um, probably reasonable with the caveat that it, depending on what month you're in, right? And so, you know, presumably if you're doing a TRH stim, you're not doing it in the months where you're going to get that seasonal increase. Um, and if it's a cost-saving measure, sure. Um, you know, I, I, the only, again, the only downside is if when you're doing follow-up testing, you're not going to have a baseline to compare to from a month later, but the month to month, unless some other thing has changed or you believe that your initial one month test was 
you know, vastly wrong for some reason, um, you know, it's probably unlikely to change that much. Um, this is a slowly progressive disease, you know, um, other than seasonal effect, you know, you don't necessarily expect huge amount of disease worsening in a one month period that would affect the ACTH. Um, you know, ACTH values do vary over the time of the day, um, not in such a way that we recommend testing at one very specific time of day or anything like that. You know, so it, it could be a gee whiz of, oh, hey, when I did my later test, actually it's a little bit outside the normal range or something. But if, you know, if, if this is a sort of every cent matters and we really wanna put money towards getting a diagnosis and then instituting therapy if needed, um, you know, within a pretty short time frame, um, you know, like a, uh, you know, weeks to a month or something like that. Um, skipping that first test is probably um, reasonable. Um, I think the thing where it comes up far more often is for whether or not you need a time zero when doing um, dynamic insulin testing, because a lot of people don't want to wait the 60 to 90 minutes to do the testing, and they'd rather say, okay, owner, give, um, you know, give a dose of care syrup, um, you know, at whatever time, I'll be there at 60 minutes or 90 minutes or both um, to do the follow-up testing. Um, and so again, if doing that, you know, if you have a prior, you know, basal insulin, you're probably fine within a pretty short period of time. Um, that is more time of day dependent um, and of course meal dependent. Um, but, uh, but again, you, you sort of lose the ability um, to have that, that time zero to compare to. Um, but with the TRH stim, you're, you know, unless, again, you suspect that there was a sample issue um, or something else affecting that first value, uh, you probably are going to get a pretty similar value your second time for your baseline. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for great questions. Um, so yeah, if, uh, if anyone else has any other questions, thoughts, concerns, experiences, etc., cetera, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear them, share them answer them if they're questions. And if not, I'm happy to let everyone get back to their lovely evenings. I have a, a quick question. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so he, he, do you have any um, feelings or has there been any work on pre, breed predisposition to sort of the time of development of PPID in the course of life? Um, yes. The reason I ask is I have you know, at, at where I have my horses, which are all standard breads, there's a, a number of retirees and now we don't interact with them. So I, I presume that would be a factor uh, that would, you know, you might notice some clinical change sooner if you rode them or, or did something with them daily. They live outside 24 seven, but they don't tend to start to show any real obvious signs of uh, hirsutism or even some of that, that weight loss drop and top line until they're over the age of 25. Yeah. And I'm not sure if that's a typical thing or if that's a standard bred thing. And then if there are breed differences. Right. Yeah. It, I, it, lots of people have tried to look um, and tried to find something because it would be great to say, OK, this breed is at increased risk. Um, and, you know, I think um, thus far, no, nobody has found um, specific breed um, predisposition to increased risk. Timing to development is a different question. Um, and I don't know that anybody's specifically looking at that yet. Um, one thing that, uh, you know, uh, well, a couple of different things um, that all kind of popped into my head. Some people are looking at genetic expression of um, both POMC and um, uh, and the you know pro hormone convertase um, enzymes that exist that cleaves the POMC into their subsequent parts um, and see differential expression of those genes in PPID affected horses versus not. So it would be really interesting to look at that in the population as a whole to see if that's a way to kind of identify you know horses or timing of development or anything like that. But that is is pretty young, um, and so it hasn't been you know generalized to the full horse population yet. Um, uh, another thing is that you know we we try you know sometimes to make comparisons to, to diseases and other species, and there's geographic distribution differences in Parkinson's disease in people, um, and um, which is not necessarily explained by other factors, um, but, uh, and, and Parkinson's in people is also, uh, you know, a, a, a neurodegenerative disease that affects dopamine. Uh, and so, you know, whether we can draw any inferences from that of, you know, regions, um, you know, where horses are more or less affected will be interesting to see whether or not that is a sort of a chicken or an egg situation as it relates to the types of horses that live there or the ages of horses that live there um, is, you know, um, obviously 
very yet to be determined, um, but you know that that could be some areas of of you know sort of additional study too. Um, I think your comment about identifying um, you know changes, particularly subtle changes in horses um, based on the level of interaction with the horse is very salient. And so um, you know horses that are handled every day, that are worked every day, that are asked to do more work um, than just be a pasture pet or, or a trail horse or, or anything you know lower, maybe those horses that do get identified earlier just because of that increased amount of demand on them and interaction with them. Um, and so that could skew sort of our perception of what we're seeing, you know, if we handled every single Shetland pony quite as often as we handled every single, you know, um, high level performance horse, uh, then we, you know, we might start to see some differences there as well. Um, but, uh, but all of that is a still yet to be determined. Um, and, uh, you know, and if we can find a relationship between time of development and, you know, and any other factors, that'd be great. Um, you know, but as of yet, there's, there's, there's nothing that I've heard of yet. Um, someone may be working on it. That'd be very cool. Cool. Thanks. Again, anybody who has a question, just pop it into the chat. Um, I'll ask one more just because there's um, a number of practitioners on the call. Um, what about adjunct treatments that owners will come up with, Chase Berry being one? Um, and are there any other, are there other uh, supplements that are being looked into? Like vitamin B12 is a big one in, in humans and canines for, for cognitive issues. And I'm not saying this is a cognitive issue, but you know, certainly for nerve health, brain health, whatnot. Yeah. And as horses age, you know, they talk about a bit of dysbiosis, the bacteria may not be able to convert uh, and produce that B12 is like in a younger horse. So just curious what's going on in that realm. Yeah, and uh, you know the 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 topic of that is uh, slightly nearer and dearer to my heart than PPID. I love PPID, but um, I, I, it's also the insulin dysregulation side of things, and that definitely is an area where the same kind of questions arise. What can I give to my horse um, from a nutraceutical supplementary front, or things that could affect um, the GI flora? Um, because uh, you know, in horses that have insulin dysregulation, you know, probably some level of um, dysbiosis is occurring as well, just based on the um, altered glucose, you know, metabolism that's occurring. Um, and so, um, you know, all of those distill down into a question of, you know, what, what best can I give my horse, um, you know, if I, if I want to supplement the pergolide or, you know, or uh, EMS management that I'm doing. Um, I, I'll scroll back if I can a couple um, slides um, just to the nutrition paper, because I actually, um, no, that one, that one. Um, they, uh, this paper actually does touch on a couple of the things that you mentioned. So um, they had suggested, um, you know, considering something like a B12 supplementation, also things like vitamin C, um, just as an antioxidant, the caveats being that there haven't been any studies looking at efficacy of these. Um, and so they're thought to sort of be a probably do no harm, um, you know, don't necessarily uh, rely on their success. But if it's part of a, you know, a, a way to try to support the horse metabolically, systemically, um, you know, those those areas might, uh, you know, uh, might be beneficial. Um, there's uh, kind of conflicting reports of the whole Chasberry um, question, uh, which is, uh, so there was a study done um, that compared um, treatment with a Chasberry product um, to, uh, to pergolide. Um, and basically the, the horses that were on the, the supplement needed to go on pergolide to have um, improvement in their laboratory values. Um, now, in terms of clinical improvement, that's where it's a little bit more mixed in terms of the, you know, sort of um, owner appreciation or veterinary appreciation of clinical improvements. Um, some of the studies are not necessarily terribly well um, set up in terms of having controls, et cetera. Um, but uh, at least in terms of a, you know, a, a, a lab improvement in, in ACTH concentration, we haven't seen that with um, with with prior studies on, on Chasberry products. Maybe some, you know, some level of clinical, at least appreciation of clinical improvement um, from an owner perspective, plus minus event perspective. Um, so um, I think that, you know, everybody's going to want to have something that's going to make their horse do better and feel better, um, particularly if it's, you know, people love supplements, et cetera. Um, I think that, you know, that the 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 thought is good in that maintaining overall wellness is excellent. Um, and so that should be a great goal. And so what that translates to, though, in terms of, you know, things that we can 
C for, uh, you know, overall good health in the horse is, you know, an evolving nutrition plan for the horse that addresses what needs to happen every six months or a year, particularly in an older horse, um, where their nutritional requirements may change and their dental and, you know, chewing abilities may change. Um, and so being very vigilant of that um, and weight management, um, you know, for the horses that need to lose weight, that they do this so safely, for the horses that need to maintain weight, that they are maintaining weight, that they're not sort of backsliding, um, supplementing in ways that are safe um, for, you know, with, in terms of fats and proteins and still probably trying to control, um, you know, non-structural carbohydrates and horses that, you know, either definitely have or you're suspicious of having insulin dysregulation, um, maintaining good hoof health, you know, uh, maintaining um, sort of a, a little bit of exercise if they can. And so, um, you know, some of the supplements certainly can get added in, um, you know, as long as you know what you're trying to achieve um, in terms of, you know, uh, support or antioxidant accident effect or whatever the case might be, but knowing full, you know, in full knowledge of the fact that most of those things have not been tested or if they have been evaluated, that their efficacy is, is typically poor. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's just important to be sort of upfront um, with owners about the fact that the knowledge is either lacking or, or typically is, um, you know, is less rosy um, with any of those supplements. Great, thanks so much. Welcome. Uh, there is one last question here. Would it be possible to get a list of the papers you mentioned in this talk as a reference um, on the re recent literature on PDID research? So I've sent everybody, or I've not sent to anybody, um, I've sent to Allison um, the list uh, or the, the whole presentation um, minus a couple of photo slides um, at the beginning um, as a handout. So everything should be listed there. Um, much of what I pulled is pretty recent and a lot of it is open access, but not everything is, um, which I recognize. And so for things that are not open access, I recommend that you um, contact the uh, corresponding author, they can send you a, a copy of their paper um, without you having to like buy a subscription to anything. They, they are able to do that. And so anything that you can't get open access, um, you know, reach out to the authors or, or your friendly local um, internist who can probably help you out as well. Um, you know, if you, if you want to find something to read a little bit more. Um, I wish everything were open access. I know everything is not. Um, a, lot, a, a lot is nowadays, but particularly a lot of like the British journals and stuff are still um, paywalled. Um, um, so I did try to sort of highlight the salient points out of those ones. Um, but if you do want to follow up on those, the authors are usually thrilled to help you out if you just say, hey, I loved, you know, this topic. Can you send me a copy of the article? Awesome. And, and on, the, on that, the uh, PDF of the presentation will be posted on the ON website where the video will be posted as well, which should be probably either towards the end of this week or, or early next week. If you want the PDF beforehand, you can email me, um, alison.more at ontario.ca. So that's A-L-I-S-O-N dot M-O-O-R-E at ontario.ca. And I can send it to you. Um, well, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So I'd really like to thank you, Dr. Thane, for your wonderful presentation. And we really appreciate it. Uh, it was a great overview, um, raised a lot of questions and thank you for the, the vets that asked questions and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. And I will say- I hope Thank you all so much. I really appreciate you all coming. If you have questions, do feel free to email me here. I'll, oops, I'm back in the chat thing. You you know, can certainly um, send me an email there. Um, I may not have necessarily Canada specific recommendations or what's available, et cetera, but happy to, to you know, um, just brainstorm generally about, um, about any topics. And anyone who's really interested in PPID research, I say, please, yes, go forward with it because we always need more information in this area. Um, and so anything we can find out more about it is great um, and helps us all as a veterinary community and, and our horses as well. So thanks again to everybody. Great. Thanks very much. Take care, everybody. <laughs>